Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, thanks a lot for making time to hear me and uh, give me a chance to interact with you and share my perspective with you guys. Thanks a lot. And uh, I hope that this session is of value to all of you. Uh, I'm just sharing my details also on the slide. Uh, we can connect later if you want. And we can also be in touch in future regarding any queries you have related to this topic or to product management in general. So uh, the topic that we have uh, selected today is um, trying to understand the importance of market research and cognitive design in product management. Uh, personally, it is of great value to me. Uh, I mean, I have been learning about market research right from my engineering days, where uh, I have always uh, found a lot of value coming when you actually go out in the market and study the competition or the consumer behavior or the macroeconomic factors. Uh, in the five port of uh, force model, you actually learn so much. And over the period of years, I also feel that cognitive design is very, very intrinsically linked with it. And I'll try and explain you how in this in this PPT. Um, so uh, discussing about the content. Uh, firstly, we will try and do a quick intro about myself. Uh, I will also try and give you some background about me so you can understand where I'm coming from, what my experience has been. Uh, then I will try and explain you a slide about how the market research process and the cognitive design are interlinked. They are almost like a, I would say, extension of each other. Uh, then we will discuss a bit about how their process works individually and what are their relevance in the whole product management cycle. And maybe I can also make it a bit interesting by sharing a few trivia and anecdotes from my own experience. Uh, lastly, we will also discuss uh, how we can create a seamless homogeneous process. That is, I feel, the critical part of making this process a success. So though they are two separate ones, but how can you make it absolutely homogeneous is, uh, is I think the most desirable aspect for any product manager. And when I'm saying for any product manager, I mean for a startup, for a SME, for a big corporate, for big tech. Uh, and I also share a couple of my favorite examples uh, from from some of the companies that I really like and I follow. So yeah, uh, talking about myself, um, as you know, my name is Nisha Singhal. I come from India. I have done my education in electronics and communication, and then I directly did my MBA after that uh, from India again. And I have been working close to about 11 years now, um, where Initially, I was working with retail companies, and in the uh, in the last six seven years, I have consciously worked with e-commerce and uh, digital payments and uh, digital banking, e-commerce payment companies. So it has been a combination of fintech and e-commerce for me. And uh, uh, currently, I'm working with Amazon in Luxembourg as a senior product manager. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I look forward to learning from each one of you. I feel uh, there's so much to learn in product management every day. It's an ever evolving kind of field. So yeah, I feel I quite enjoy this space personally. Um, so OK, starting from this topic that how are market research and cognitive design interlinked? Firstly, uh, what I would say is that the most common aspect of these two is that they both are extremely customer centric processes. They both reside in the crux of customer being 
the central piece in both the processes. Uh, they revolve around exactly what the user or the customer wants. And that's where I feel they somewhat come together because they are like your source of truth. Market research is when you are going and talking to the customer. Cognitive design is when you are using that inputs to build something for that particular user. And that's when you are actually checking whether what you have designed is, is working for the user or not. So I'll, I'll come to the processes later, but yeah, the customer centricity, centricity is the most common aspect between the two. Also, uh, the most beautiful part of, about these two processes is that they are constantly iterative. Uh, you will always find it a work in progress. You start with uh, maybe a A and then you will keep on adding more alphabets to make it a full sentence and that also never gets completed and there are more and more thoughts added to it. Uh, also, they both involve your qualitative and quantitative skill sets. Uh, whether it is in terms of your uh, creative space, whether it is in terms of your uh, numeric skill sets. So they, they involve both, both inputs to make a particular decision. Uh, as I said earlier also that they constantly feed from each other and you will find that it is, if, if you do a good job with one of them, the other one will automatically get better. Uh, what is good about or difficult about these two processes is that they are not exactly like a SOP. Nobody can form like step one, two, three, exactly about these two processes. And that's where a, a product manager, or I would say a good team who is agile in the way they work, who, who work in close collaboration can come together to make it a, a, a successful process. Because I don't think so there is one process that fits all. There is one example that fits all. No, you can take inspiration from different companies, but you have to find your own uh, piece of uh, clothing that, that fits you, that suits you. So yeah, that's, what, that's how I'll describe it. Um, also, a lot of companies tend to miss it. I feel that because it's, it, it's a little uh, creative skill set or somewhat, I would say, that requires a lot of thought into it, effort, sometimes cost also, time definitely. A lot of companies tend to think that they already know what customer wants and they can exactly put it to paper and can actually make it absolutely the way customer wants, feels. But I, 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 can, I can quote you multiple examples where this has actually gone wrong. In fact, one of the stats says that 95% of the startups fail because they they don't do a proper market research. Uh, also, the, they, they both require combination of different skill sets. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to find an expert who can say that I know I know everything about them. No, uh, sorry, it, it, it requires you to have good writing skill set, writing skill sets, good uh, designing skill sets, good documentation skill sets, good interviewing skill sets. So it's it's very it's very multidimensional that way. As I already said, it's it's very they both are very effective for the agile methodology and being always closer to what customer wants and what markets are saying. Um, maybe I'll now quickly tell you a bit about the process of market research. So, as the this this diagram says that market research is using your five senses and maybe six senses to capture the, the six senses or the five senses of the customer. So they are basically all your senses at work constantly, and you have to effectively use them uh, to, to record, to understand what the customer is saying, wanting. Uh, and these are the few methods. There are qualitative methods, as you know, uh, focus group discussions, there are interviews, then there is diary recording where you keep a record of last 30 days of customer behavior. You can also do quick dip feedbacks, which personally I find very useful at every stage of your iteration. You build a prototype, you take a quick feedback from your customer set, 
you come back, you you get a reality check whether you are on the right track or not. So I have personally benefited from them a lot. Uh, quantitative methods, and there are a lot of tools available on, on internet now, and that's the advantage. You have so many different tool sets, but at the, at the cost of your own data, uh, which you can make use of, including A-B testing, online surveys, beta launch, heat map analysis, uh, recordings that you can do. Um, yeah, there are there are quite a few uh, that are uh, that are made available to them. Uh, maybe uh, I, I have tried to describe also the process for market research here, where you actually state the problem, you try and find what is the root cause analysis for it, you build a mechanism around it, you try and define and know the process and then you try and own it to exactly how to implement it in the market. And I can tell you this is something which uh, uh, we all follow very, very closely across different companies. Um, I, maybe one of the trivias that I can share from my own personal experience is that not all the tools will be effective all the time. You will need maybe 30% of them, 60% of them, depending on the situation. But what is most important as a product manager is to know the central theme and be honest and truth, truthful to it. That really helps. Keep your vision as, as constant. And other methods can just validate that. So that would be my tip. Um, coming to now the relevance aspect of it. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the relevance, uh, why market research makes sense? I think, firstly, it is an extremely data-driven decision-making rather than you deciding the priority of your roadmap, you deciding which UI and UX make sense, what branding makes sense, what kind of content makes sense, which, which feature uh, should be absolutely uh, not, not, not be done what stage of your PLC you are, product life cycle you are. These decisions can be made on impulse. They can be made on your uh, just judgment of a few group of people. But I feel if you have a lot of data to back yourself up with proper market research, it brings a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of homogeneity in, in, in different, different group sets. You can bring people together on the table you can agree with them in terms of uh, uh, what is to be done. And it, it is a if very, very effective collaboration tool uh, because at any stage you get stuck during your roadmap discussions, during your persona discussions, during your design, you can always say the market research said so. That's why it, it should be done like this. Um, it becomes almost like your Bible, I would say. Um, a lot of co different companies call it differently. For example, I think, uh, for example, Amazon uses empty chair, fundamental. A lot of people call it the vision at the end of the tunnel. Some people call it the brain mapping, brain image, the central rhythm. So I've, I've heard different people call it in different ways. Uh, also, it, it helps you identify your user persona and to basically get closer to them in terms of their values, in terms of their drivers, in terms of their demographics, in terms of their financial uh, knowledge, in terms of their uh, brand preferences, uh, in terms of their lifestyle choices. So that way market research is very, very important. Uh, also, it makes a lot of sense in getting the product market fitment correct, which is the key to success for any product. If you know your market, you know your segment, and you can target it well, and you can place the product perfectly, you have you have success. Um, and uh, I maybe wanted to highlight that to know why market research is relevant, maybe you should read the book Brand Failures, and you will see a lot of examples there that where companies felt really bad about not doing proper market research. Um, also, in my experience, my own UX agency, which came from Singapore, and they were extremely good at their work. 
they were not very keen on doing market research. They felt that they know their job and they can implement it beautifully. But I insisted that no, we need to at least talk to 10 to 15 users. And they later thanked me that that was the right idea and uh, that was absolutely required and valid. Also, maybe if I can suggest, don't do a lot of market research in the beginning itself. Make it iterative. Keep eight to 10 people in the beginning and then slowly go on checking with the same set of people or new set of people, depending on your experience. So now we will come to the process for cognitive design. Um, cognitive design can also be called heuristic design. A lot of people call it uh, in, in different way. People call it human centric design also. Um, and what is important about is that, as I was telling you, it's, it's an iterative process. It's a collaborative process. Uh, it, it works in a form of a process model. Uh, so there is this first stage where you do the market research, you collate the inputs for your target user persona, then you start with a prototype. It can be a white sketch, it can be a, an actual app with minimalistic features. It can be even, I would say, a hard model. Uh, it doesn't have to be an app. It can be just a model that you want to test out and get people's feedback on. So something to start with and then you, get feedback on it, you uh, filter it down, you iterate the model, and you keep on perfecting it till the time you are ready to launch it in the market, till the time you, as a group, agree that your product is now ready. You take it to the market, then you launch it, then you see what, what's the feedback coming, you analyze on different success metrics, and then you keep on optimizing your product. Uh, and, and that process goes on for, for a very long time. Uh, obviously, cognitive design uh, involves implementation of a lot of UI and UX uh, and UX models, uh, which personally is of great uh, passion to me. Um, and I think this is where it makes it very interesting that how do you capture uh, different human elements, whether it is to do with designing, with visualization, uh, with the speed of the navigation, uh, with the way uh, information architecture is laid out, with the way uh, different uh, flow call flows are uh, laid out, uh, which particular user journey do you prioritize first? These all are decisions that you make basis human centricity. So you make use of, as the diagram shows, their sight, their hearing, the way they touch, they smell, and that is how you build the perception and you create something and uh, at the end of the day it is a subjective decision but you try and make it as closer to being objective and data driven as possible using different processes and yeah uh, you you try and make the the decision for the customer as closer to their requirements possible uh, another important aspect of cognitive design process is that it's always a team effort Nobody can run it single-handedly, not even a founder or a CEO can do a single-handed job out of it. You will need a good team of designer, researchers, developers, testers, uh, also content writers uh, who can actually support you. So please make sure that you are working very well in a team. You should be, at the end of the day, a uh, uh, I would say a people-centered person in order to work in these kind of industries and products. Mm, one more trivia from my own experience. Please don't think that you can involve developers much later once your design is ready. No, involve your developers as early as possible. As soon as you have some research, some inputs ready, and you start building the prototype, start involving the developers already and start giving them inputs on what your product looks like, what your customer looks like, what uh, how, how you see your user journeys to be. So make them part of the communication all throughout. Uh, that, that would really pay a, lot, pay a lot of dividends in the end. 
Um, coming to the relevance of cognitive design, next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So the relevance for cognitive cogn uh, cognitive design will be that uh, it's it's a very scientific process. It involves different uh, aspects of uh, human psychology, ergonomics, uh, all combined into one. And uh, I think we are in a very good space right now where we are uh, understanding more and more about how human mind works. Uh, we are getting more and more aware about our own senses, about other people's way of thinking. And this is where I feel uh, uh, cognitive design makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't think so a time will come. You can exactly predict what human want and how they, they think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe with the neural and the artificial intelligence you can, but uh, you should always have human element at the end of the day, but yeah, the, the deal is to know your customer very well, to know a set of your users so well that you can actually just think for them with a the blink of an eye. Uh, another uh, relevance of co cognitive design is that you make the whole process to be a documented process and you can track its progress over the over a time and different members can contribute to it. And you can make it, as I said many times, a collaborative process for everyone to see how things have grown. And trust me, it's, it's a very beautiful journey when you see how your pro product was two years back and where it is now, and the kind of quality of points that you are able to bring, the quality of nuances you are able to bring in your decision making, over the two periods, just because of these processes, it, it is quite, I would say, rewarding. And always treat these things to be a long-term process. Nobody has been able to gain a lot of insights in, in a short while. Uh, also, they are extremely helpful in making other decisions for other teams, whether it is your co content strategy, whether it is your acquisition engagement strategy, uh, whether it is your go-to-market uh, strategy, uh, it, it actually makes a lot of sense for people to, uh, to yeah, it actually makes a lot of sense for people to uh, invest in this process and see its impact across different companies. And I have seen it for myself uh, where, uh, uh, I mean, firstly, the company was not ready to invest into it. And once they did, they themselves saw the impact coming for everyone, right? From technology to merchant acquisition team to operations team to, uh, I would say, uh, your uh, customer care team, of course, and your product team, marketing team, obviously your sales team, etc. But you could see that this piece could tie across different team and it was almost like a, like a central thought that was going around people and they all could value the investment that it brought. Um, another good part about this is that it helps you track the latest trends, the good practices which are happening for different companies, for different industries. You can have a quick feedback mechanism around it also. It helps you build open source tech. So that's something I can tell you from my experience in previous companies that if you have a cognitive design process, it enables you to keep the source for tech open. You can keep it iterative also. Since design is also is not fixed, the technology also can play the variable loop. It can build different kind of microservices around it. It can build uh, open APIs around it and it can uh, it can basically keep it iterative and it can use the permutation combination to bring different solution sets together. Um, yeah, and I already, already covered this point that it builds consistency across teams. Uh, next. Yeah, now the most important aspect that how do we build a homogeneous process and how do we make sure that it is working beautifully uh, across different teams and 
most importantly how can you convince your management your leadership to invest into it uh what i have observed and learned what gives a lot of confidence to leadership business to invest in your idea is if you have a concept if you have the conviction to execute it and you yourself are very well thought out so when you are presenting that idea to them they should see it in you and your team that you know what you are saying and you know the data the points the quality of people that you are bringing is worth investing into and you know your subject so well so that is one aspect obviously that be confident be convinced about what you are going to uh, management with uh, have an excellent team don't uh, i would say compromise on the quality of people uh, and have i would say if possible multi skill people who can do the job for different roles in the initial stage of uh, of of the role great but ultimately you would want it to be an evolved team where people know their job they are quite mature with their skill sets and uh, you can depend on their advices uh, and trust me these are extremely i would say evolved skill sets if you uh, if you are in india i feel sometimes uh, they get confused but if you if you come abroad and if you start uh, working with a lot of global tech companies you will understand that market research is very different from ux research and that's that's something which is very very basic uh, in here and uh, you need to appreciate its nuances uh designers can also be different i mean you you can have a different ui designer a different ux designer a different graphic designer uh for content also you can have copyright specialist or people who are extremely good with research content research uh and then obviously developers in which you will have your mobile developer you will have web developer you will have ios android developers and uat specialist so all in all you it can be as big as i would say a 25 30 member team with unique members but then i have seen many design labs working very well with 3 to 5 members also so again as i said there's no one size fits all you have to see how it works for you and uh, and then take a call from there uh it it also helps if you have some uh, i would say models or processes that you guys follow like uh it can be around uh, five port of fours i'm just giving example it could be around phase gate model for prioritization it could be around the moscow theory for prioritization uh it could be around agreeing on the minimum viable product or many people call it the minimum lovable product so whatever works i would say in terms of agreeing on a few uh processes and models in the beginning that that helps that really helps in uh, getting people together and agreeing on a lot of points when uh, you have different varying points uh, from different people um and also a, a central theme uh, of agreement on user persona for market fitment uh, project deliverables of course i mean at the end of the day you cannot run the show if you if you don't know your timeline your deliverables what is the eta etc coming and that's where a effective product manager has to play that stitching role of nucleus amongst different teams yeah next yeah so spotify is one of my favorite examples i feel that they have done a brilliant job of capturing human emotions human thoughts of capturing uh, their lifestyle choices even the way they think at different points of the day <laughs> so uh, how you feel on a monday morning is very different how you feel on a wednesday evening and uh, somehow they seem to say that they know that they know you so uh, and and again i'm not saying that they know everyone absolutely perfectly but just trying to aim to know your customers in the way they think feel listen 
uh, talk. I feel they have they have done a good job, and I do appreciate them for that. And uh, as you can see, that they they have these different variables, whether it is on tempo, whether it is in the way you have interacted with the engine in the past, in terms of what genre of music you listen to, what song lengths do you listen to, when do you play song. uh which are the kind of artists you follow uh which are what are your uh, uh i mean songs that you listen on repeat so a lot of such analysis goes into different features and that's how they try and know you better they keep they have this whole nlp uh, uh process where they keep on taking the feedback from customers interactions and keep building it into the recommendation engine and yeah i think uh, it's one of the good ones that we have uh, next yeah uh, airbnb is also something i feel uh, which has done quite well in terms of evolving their home page mobile app design based on doing these multiple ab testing at the same time uh travel industry or the ota industry that we call them uh, i they they do have these multiple ab testing procedure as any product manager will tell you and uh, they have i would say at the same time about 1000 to 2000 ab tests running on at the same time during uh, during a session and you might be a participant in five ab testing when you are doing a user journey and you will just not realize it and uh, that's that's how quick and iterative the whole process is uh, in here i have tried to share an example about how they redesign their home page basis quite a few ab testing uh, where they took uh, inputs from people from different uh, countries and uh, they ensured that the ab testing was live for enough number of days for them to capture sufficient database uh, and that's something i would suggest for ab testing that don't overrun it but make sure that you are capturing enough uh, sample base for 10 to 15 days of your average user base and uh, it involves a lot of statistical analysis also so don't i would say make it a a quick decision process that okay one ab test said this so i will make make changes like that no it's 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 about collaborating on uh, on your inputs and maybe running the same ab test at different points of time during the month to ultimately come to a decision that what is working and what is not working so let's say if you have an important launch of a product 3 months down the line make sure that you are running 4 to 5 ab test around some critical hypothesis of yours uh, for for the same user journey Uh, which are designed and presented in a different way so that the customer doesn't get biased about your uh, about your test so yeah that would be my second favorite example and um, yeah and that's all i have to present to you uh, for any q and a I hope uh, you can reach out to me if I have not answered it already in the chat and yeah it'll be a great opportunity for me to interact with all of you and learn from all of you as much as possible and thanks product school for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you and I hope it was useful and uh, yeah please be in touch thank you